Hello and welcome to Philosophy Vibe, the channel where we discuss and debate different philosophical ideas. Today is part two of the Philosophy of Mind debate. Excellent. So just a quick recap. We began Philosophy of Mind looking into substance dualism, the idea that the mind and body are separate. The central basis on this was because the body is a material substance and is spatially located, whereas the mind is non-spatial and indivisible. But most importantly, our mental states are completely private and non-observable to anyone other than the individual. That being the case, there is strong evidence to suppose the mind and body are distinct and separate. Correct. However, my argument was that this line of thought will eventually lead to solipsism if our mental states are completely private and non-observable to anyone other than the individual, all you can be sure of is your own thoughts and ideas and your own mind. This will inevitably lead to the doubt of all other minds and you will naturally conclude that you may very well be the only conscious being in existence. Okay, I want to first carry on arguing against ellipsism. At this point, I would like to raise Wittgenstein's private language argument. Now, I want you to imagine a private language in which the only person who can understand it is the person using it. No one else in the world can understand this language or can ever be able to understand this language. Now, would you agree it would make no sense for this person to ever use this private language? Yes. So then think of it like this. If I have a sensation or a feeling if no one could understand it other than me, it would make no sense for me to ever talk about it or to compare it to anyone else's feeling as no one else can ever have this feeling. So I know from my own case what I mean when I say I am sad or I am in pain, but if I'm the only conscious mind, this would be a private language, i.e. I can speak a language that only I understand because the words of this language refer to the logically private states in my mind. I agree. Well, if there were no other minds, I could not then attach feelings with words if they are solely private. In order to do this, they need to be public. They need to be understood and recognized by other minds. But as we know, we do talk about our feelings and sensations. We attach words to them so we can discuss them with other people and other people can know what we're talking about. Hmm. Wittgenstein denies the possibility of a private language. He argues that language is necessarily public in nature. It would not be possible to engage in conversation were it not for the existence of common meanings. Unlike the private language, we can share our thoughts and feelings and mental ideas. Even though we have not seen other people experience these mental states, we have a common language where we can discuss them proving other people all have the same or similar mental ideas. This then eliminates solipsism and the problem of other minds, as there is a language relating to mental ideas which others can understand, and I can talk about my mental ideas and other minds can understand and respond to this, proving there are other thinking minds experiencing mental ideas. Fair enough, but does the private language argument contradict Cartesian dualism in the sense that mental states are not then private and non-observable? They can be known to others the same direct way they are known to the individual. If this is the case, then we should actually drop the dualist approach and adopt a materialist point of view. Explain what that is. Materialism is a branch of philosophy of mind which argues that the mind and body are not distinct but the same thing and mental states are nothing more than physical interactions. Right. Logical behaviorism is a branch of materialism which falls under the section of reductive materialism arguing that all mental states can be reduced to physical states. Logical behaviorism argues that any conversation about mental states is nothing more than a conversation about one's behavior. To discuss a mental state such as I am happy is nothing more than a description of my physical state, e.g. smiling or laughing. Gilbert Ryle took this position claiming that all there was was the physical body and there was no ghost in the machine, so to speak. 
he gives the analogy of someone being shown around a university campus. They are shown the library, the student union, the lecture theatre, etc, etc, and after, the person thanks them for showing around, but then asks, where is the university? This person has clearly misunderstood what he was shown. The university is not something above and beyond the buildings they were shown. All the things they were shown constitute the university, just like all the parts of the body constitute the individual and nothing more. The mind is nothing above and beyond the person. So when we speak about mental states, all we are doing is speaking about the behaviour a certain person expresses. So discussing mental states like pain, you look at the behaviour associated, a cry, a recoil, a rubbing of a body part, etc, etc. I understand, but sometimes behaviour does not correlate to someone's mental state. Consider the great actor who looks exactly like they're in pain, but merely just putting on a great show for the audience. Or the tough Spartan warrior who is badly wounded, but does not want anyone to see them in pain, so he keeps all the pain inside and carries on as normal. I see. Also, logical behaviourism does not explain the qualia our minds perceive. What is qualia? Qualia is the quality or property as perceived by a specific individual. Like my experience of looking at the colour red, the way I see red, my experience of it is an example of qualia. So too is the feeling of pleasure I have when I eat ice cream or the pain I have from a headache. Qualia are therefore the subjective conscious experience. Behaviorism does not explain our experience. Sure, we may act in a certain way, but the experience behind it, it has nothing to say about that. Interesting. Also, for logical behaviorism to be true, it must be inconceivable for two beings to have the same behavioral dispositions, but differ in the qualia they perceive. But this isn't the case. John loves the color red, it makes him smile. Jane loves the color purple, it makes her smile. Same behavioral dispositions, but they are perceiving different qualia. They each have their own conscious experience. I see. So I do not think logical behaviorism works. Okay, maybe we should just simplify it and take the identity theory point of view. This is nothing more than saying your mind is your brain. The mental is the physical and nothing more. Our mental states, such as the mental state of being in pain or being happy or being in love, are identical to our brain states and that would be electrochemical events at synapses, nerve impulses, the movement of chemical messengers, the movement of molecules, ions, etc, etc. I see. So when you say you are feeling pain, this is nothing more than neurological processes in your brain causing you to feel pain. So we see no problems of mind-body interaction as they are one and the same so it escapes the problems of dualism. Well, here I would like to raise Leibniz's law. Are you familiar with this? Not exactly. Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz argued that if two things are identical, they must be one and the same. So if A is identical to B, then all features of A must be true of B. Yes, correct. So then, if the brain is identical to the mind, and let's say I have a mental state of anger, the anger will be about something. I am angry because someone smashed my car. But how can a brain state be about something? How can the movement of molecules and nerve impulses be angry about something? I see. The brain is also spatially located. So when I feel love, are we to say that love is located at the right side of my skull? This sounds ridiculous. You can of course open up my skull and see my brain, but you cannot point to something and say, oh look, that's love right there. You can look at my brain, but you cannot see what I am thinking. The conceptual thoughts I have cannot manifest themselves to you. Again, this all comes down to conscious experience. Materialism fails to address this, so I fail to see how identity theory could work. Interesting. Well, that's all for now. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoyed the vibe. The next video will be the third and final video on the philosophy of mind debate, and we'll be looking into the functionalist theory. So make sure you tune in for that. Don't forget to like, share and subscribe. Take care and we'll see you all soon.